It's Friday Feedback Friday, the feedbackiest day of the week. Ha, it's Feedback Friday. Uh, in advance, I am freaking knackered recording this, so I will do my best to make sense in some pretty, pretty fraught, delicate, I'm already stumbling, uh, subject matter. But give me a break. If something's not clear, don't jump to conclusions, don't flip out. Because that's been the problem of late. I'm going to plug the patron right away because I've been forgetting to do this. And it does actually affect how many people sub. Because I don't watch right till the end. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. It's amazing how much difference doing that off the top does. Um, so regarding the feedback of the week, I'm going to leave the pro Jared thing alone now. It seems to have died down in interest anyway. Um, and I set out what I plan to do with that video, which was express a viewpoint that I think needed to be put out there that because of identity politics, men couldn't say. And a bunch of people thanked me for that. So mission accomplished, that awareness of identity politics um, will come back later because these things are realities in our culture. More on that in a bit. Um, moving on to the, the Mortal Kombat thing this was really interesting because comments from the youtube video came up as a point of discussion in the twitch chat and if if you um haven't checked it out yet highly recommend showing up for twitch um it's live anything can happen yesterday some jehovah witnesses showed up at my door uh, while I was recording and the dog went crazy, so I had to answer the door. Momo broke my headphones. It was my, my earbuds that I wear, not these. Uh, it, was, it was madness. But uh, the chat's really good. And like we get into politics and all that stuff and people don't kill each other. So if you want good discussion, um, Tuesdays, 6 p.m., Thursdays, 1 p.m., so 1,300 hours. Thursdays, Sekiro. Tuesdays been Tropico 6, but we stopped paying attention to the game after a while and just talk. Um, but uh, really, really good times. Really good group. Really mature. Um, but uh, it came up that people were disturbed by the lack of empathy inherent in the comments that responded to the news that some artists on Mortal Kombat ended up traumatized by the amount of real world violent footage they had to view. Uh, the response was basically, they knew what they signed up for. It's Mortal Kombat, come on. And one person theorized that this was just people not wanting to think about it, that they like the game and so they don't want to think, you know, the, the Little Mermaid line, how could a world that makes such wonderful things, how could it be bad, you know? I just don't, oh, the line is, I just don't see how a world that makes such wonderful things could be bad, you know, and cue part of your world musical number. Um, and I think that's the most charitable way of coming at it. So that's, that's where I'm going to land. Um, but yeah, nobody signs up to end up with recurring vivid nightmares doing art stuff. That just, that logic doesn't make any sense. Thinking you know what's involved in a job and actually knowing what's involved in a job, especially in any creative field, you cannot prepare yourself for the steady diet of abuse that you're often fed in creative industries. I'm talking about the television industry more than gaming. Gaming is actually better than TV in my experience. But um, yeah, I'll just leave that there because I'm trying to be charitable. It's an explanation that doesn't demonize anyone. Again, let's leave it there. Because I want to talk about the Game of Thrones video, which at first look is the most polarizing video I have ever done on YouTube. To put this in perspective, that Jax video I got in all the trouble people calling me a racist for, at its lowest, it was at 69% and then started going back up. The Game of Thrones video from this week bottomed out at 48.9% before going back up to about, it's hovering around 49, 50%. You're like, wow, that's really bad. But this is why statistics, you know, there's lies, damn lies and statistics. 
the way YouTube measures these engagements is actually flawed. And I realize this now, and I'm never going to be able to unsee this. Um, the ratio that they give you, the percentage, is just likes versus dislikes. It's not the percentage of dislikes versus overall views or likes versus overall views. It's just likes versus dislikes. And so in the case of the Game of Thrones video, one in 300 people had a strong enough opinion to push a button. One in 300 people is not a majority viewpoint by far. I think that's like obvious. So most people just were like, meh, they may have got a chuckle about it. They didn't care one way or another. I don't hit likes very often myself, I admit. So most people just essentially lurk or they leave a comment or something like that, whatever. But the like-dislike ratio is actually a really bad metric to tell how people felt about the video. And I think that the chat in Twitch when we talked about it was more representative, which was very pleasant. But the knee-jerk reactions from people were really instructive. Remember I said identity politics was going to come back because I was accused of um, diminish, like limiting my analysis. Like it was just derivative identity politics, my analysis of the episode. Because of a couple comments that took up less than a minute of a 15 minute video. That doesn't wash. You know, I talked about um, the the historical context for a lot of the things that everybody was freaking out a lot more than I talked about. I made a comment about um, it's kind of awkward that we've now set up that Jon Snow is this, you know, white straight male savior saving, you know, the women and the people of color from overwhelming, uncontrollable emotions. Um and people got mad at me for that. It was an aside. It was something I said glibly. It was not intended to be that meaningful. It was just kind of a cheeky quip. Um, in in part because I get really annoyed at people who read too much into Game of Thrones. So it was kind of a, a I won't say it was a joke, but it was kind of a barb at, oh yeah, this lofty television. No, it really isn't. But people reduced their reactions to what I was saying about that. And people got really salty when I said George R. R. Martin can't write women well. I actually got called sexist for that opinion, which is absurd. The reasoning behind the person calling me sexist was even more absurd. Um, they said... Saying that George R. R. Martin can't write women well is sexist because it means all women must behave alike. No, that is not what it means. The very problem I have with George R. R. Martin's writing of women is that with two and a half notable exceptions, they are only interested in babies, boys, a combination of boys and babies. That's pretty much it. And status, right? Status. Um, and people argue, well, that's because of the world. But let's break this down, okay? Um, the only way a Game of Thrones character becomes remotely um, interesting is if they chuck off femininity. Arya, Arya Stark and Brienne of Tarth are, are the two big examples. They es essentially assume the roles of men in the culture and so they have much more freedom of choice um you get all these other women who play the game and then you have daenerys who's the very clear anomaly and we had a really great uh discussion in on on the twitch uh chat about the benevolent sexism that's flung at at daenerys and the you know, the interpretations of her actions, the way her actions are judged. It was a really fascinating discussion from a guy who normally doesn't go in for that. And he's like, I think I, he was basically like, I think I get it now. Like, I don't know if I'm really attached to this, just really attached to this character. And so, but, oh my God, I can't help but feel like it's benevolent sexism. And I said, actually, the fact that you care about the character is why you see it. So I said to him, realize you're right in this case and apply that same standard 
going forward to characters you don't feel as as strongly about. Now, to a lesser scale, um, men in in George R. R. Martin's writing are less interesting the more traditionally masculine they are as well, you know. But there are more exceptions to that. You know, one could argue that, okay, Sam Tarley is like a, a fluffy guy, so he's not the ideal man. Sir Jorah, they constantly talk about how old he is, so he's, you know, past his prime sort of thing. They're, they have license to be interesting because they're not ideals. But then you get into characters like Ned Stark, who's very clearly crafted. Tyrion Lannister, again, you know, he's a, he's a dwarf, so there's that but <sighs> Ned Stark really well crafted character uh Robert Baratheon is is a trope um not terribly interesting but and <sighs> Rob Stark isn't that interesting but um you know Bran is allowed to be very different again you could say oh he's disabled he's a person with a disability therefore but I don't know he he definitely fits into that sort of mystic um, he's like the Stephen Hawking of, of Westeros. Um, there, there are, the issue is there are much, there's a much greater range of pre-existing archetypes for men to fit into. And so when you're an archetype driven writer, like George R. R. Martin, um, there is a lot more starting points to put your male characters than your female characters. So when you start playing out, like he writes like a role player, um, when you start playing that out, you have a greater diversity of starting points than the women. Now, the one exception to that is Caitlin Stark. And... I think what you're supposed to believe about Caitlyn Stark is she's a lot more like Arya than Sansa at her core. She's split right down the middle. Um, but she wasn't given the opportunities that Arya did to defy her gender and therefore she kind of got stuck in that um, rigid feminine role, gender role in in uh, in the world of Game of Thrones. Incredibly patriarchal world. That's not me making a judgment call. That's deliberate. It's medievalist, yada, yada, yada. But there were always certain things about Caitlin Stark that just didn't click for me. And it's, this is going to be really hard to explain without triggering someone based on how this has gone so far. So... I ask for your patience and calm. I'm going to try to unpack this, but for, with an example of what I mean by, um, you know, comments like Game of Thrones tends to come at, or A Song of Ice and Fire tends to come at women from a male perspective. It's like a masculinized framing explaining the decisions of women. Because... You know, it's that de Beauvoir, one is not born a woman, one becomes one thing. And unless you've actually gone through that crucible of femini feminized upbringing, um, you don't understand it. Um, it's very difficult for most guys to connect to the unique hell that is the feminine you guys got your own things, right? You guys got your own things that you got to struggle with. I'm not seeing um, mas masculine training, masculine social training is, is, is a cakewalk by any stretch. There's a lot of issues with it too. They're just not the same issues as, as women. And in those really staunch patriarchies, like in Westeros, the sort of ongoing thing is um, all men will cheat if you let them do it. Don't freak out. I'm not saying this. I'm saying this is the archetype for these sorts of worlds. Um, there are uncontrollable, basically, lust demons. Guys just screw everything that moves. You can't expect less. Um, you're lucky if he doesn't cheat on you much. You're extremely lucky if he never cheats on you. There is... Not the same expectation of fidelity in a world 
where bastards are running around everywhere. And the thing that never sat quite right for me with with Caitlin Stark is her inability to ever really connect with Jon Snow. It seemed like a plot device to just push him in a certain way instead of it being a realistic extension of her pragmatism because a pragmatic woman in this situation is able to isolate her feelings for her husband's betrayal and and the kid um it's not the kid's fault uh and you know kind of caitlin's all like we make the best of it so hey he only did it once that's way better than most men all right the way she approached Jon Snow is almost a threat, is a much, is what you would expect much more of the firstborn son. The same way there's like Daenerys is like, oh, now he has a more legitimate claim, that jockeying. And I'm not saying it's impossible for a character who's female to have that, just the way Caitlyn uh, Stark is set up. Is it Caitlyn or Catelyn? I don't remember anymore. But um, the way she's set up, it doesn't seem to fit other elements of her character. So we're back to, oh, she's just emotional on this point. And to me, in the series Game of Thrones, I actually think the most pure emotional response in the whole thing was the one that a lot of people complained about which was after that you know whirlwind romance Jamie ditches Brienne to go back to Cersei and Brienne just loses it that's honest and people were like oh you ruined her no I liked the fact that even with all her hard edges as tough as she was nobody doubts her toughness she's she's still human she's still hurt now, I hope we get one more look at her because if that's where the series leaves her, that sucks. Hopefully, she'll have one more moment uh, at the end so we can see her kind of get beyond that. Um, but, you know, this is what I mean by there's all these dodges to avoid um, really getting into what a world like that would do to a woman's thinking and there's an element of surrender that um you see in stuff like Jane Austen's writing or Mary Shelley's writing that it, it it's a distinctly feminine perspective and, and some male writers do a very good job of it. Um, Terry Pratchett writes women fantastically well. Um, you know, I talked about this. Granny Weatherwax is a, is a crone figure, but she's her own person and she's got that sort of world weariness. She gets her barbs in through quips, right? Um, I highly recommend reading Terry Pratchett to see an example of a, a male writer who can write female character voice well in that he's able to make women true individuals, positive facing characters instead of a whole bunch of not men. And they've got one more episode to change my mind. Again, they have one more episode to make me go, all right, not so much, but the reaction to Daenerys reminds me a lot of the reaction to Skylar White in Breaking Bad, which I didn't understand either. Um, a lot of Skylar White's reactions actually made a lot more sense than a lot of the women on Game of Thrones to me. Like, she's stuck. There's all these Rico stuff. She's trying to keep her family, to, you know, her kids taken care of and provided for in what's essentially a single income family because she's, you know, she was essentially a stay-at-home mom with, with a side hustle. Um, and she's thrown in this impossible situation because of the way the drug laws in America work. She became this big villain. People hated her. And I never quite understood it. It, it took the the team, the Breaking Bad team uh, caught, caught kind of off guard too 
And uh, the actress who played her wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about how hated the character is. Um, You're seeing similar things with Daenerys in that she's defying what a woman should be. I don't think it's as well handled as... um, as Skylar White was, just because, as people pointed out, it it comes in, in bits. Like, there are a lot more characters in Game of Thrones, so we don't get as much time with them. I disagree that this decision with her was not extremely foreshadowed. I think there are two main points, near term and then long term. Um, all, the, all the speeches in the Dothraki camp season one are all about how they take cities. And Daenerys's names are extremely important. Uh, Daenerys Stormborn, you know, Khaleesi, Mother of Dragons, all that stuff. That was a Khaleesi moment, not a Daenerys Tar- Targaryen moment. Um, but also the fact that Cersei was relying on people not going there. And she met her match with someone who was going there. And I think that's kind of interesting because, I mean, Cersei essentially killed one of Daenerys' kids. If you think of it that way, killed her kid, killed her, you know, her killed Jorah, how you describe her, her, her two closest advisors. Um, but she killed her freaking dragon kid, man. She killed her toast kin. <laughs> and that's why I said, I don't think she's crazy mad. I think she's angry mad fits more um and the burn it all down instinct makes sense when you look at it that way it does make sense I don't know why people wanted it spelled out for them I like trying to have to figure out why she did it it went on too long um why she didn't just go straight for the keep doesn't make any sense based on the showrunner's explanations but that choice itself does make some sense. Um, but it defies the feminine, doesn't it? And I think it's an interesting arc from somebody who is basically offered up as, as chattel to a, a foreign ruler to form an alliance um, to... And it makes more sense in the books because they changed... Daenerys and Drogo's wedding night for the show but um it it's an interesting arc it's an interesting um evolution of the character sort of coming into what it's like to be a ruler in in that in that world it's a ruthless you know when you what what isn't that the line when you play the game of thrones you win or you die Cersei lost she died um But, uh, I mean, that's what they've been saying since season one. What happened, what we were talking about on Twitch, is because Daenerys didn't um, chuck off all semblances of femininity, she didn't become King Daenerys. She's queen. She's still queen. She's still identifying as as female as opposed to Arya's and Brienne's I am no lady thing. She's defying gender roles, and so people can't handle it. Even though, like, how many people has Arya killed? Brienne, she's killed people in hand in combat. I mean, okay, they weren't innocents, but when Arya was training to be a, an assassin, they they wanted her to kill innocents. She struggled against it, but that was the gig. But because she wasn't doing it in a dress and long flowing hair, people have less problem with it. And in order to overcome that, you need to be so deliberate in writing and understand how people react to issues that hinge on gender this way, hinge on identity politics. If you don't know what you're doing, you get these unexpected reactions and people are disappointed because American TV audiences don't like to be challenged. They like to have their expectations fulfilled. Even expect the unexpected, you know, Walking Dead, nobody's bothered by all the the characters dying every week because they expect a character to die every week. That's an example, right? Um, 
it's a big problem analyzing uh, Japanese and Chinese um, uh, TV shows and movies and things like that because they work on a completely different paradigm that a lot of Westerners don't get. But <sighs> the fact that people had such a strong, re the people who did have a strong reaction had such a strong reaction resorted to, you're a bad person arguments oh you resorted to identity politics and in the next breath it's like and of course she did she's at the end of the day she's a feminist like how is that not identity politics like it is just people not stopping and listening to what they're saying in their responses so i'm not taking it personally i find it fascinating because it teaches me again about how messages are received and what those knee jerks are. And in order to really persuade, in order to effectively educate and, and find common ground on sensitive subjects, it seems like everything's a sensitive subject now, those kind of triggers, and I say that like legitimately, it's not an insult, those triggers have to be understood so they can be sidestepped. And that's going to take some work because most people aren't trying to consider other people's feelings in that way. They're trying to, you know, hit the right targets and clobber them to make them have a big reaction. It's like, oh, I triggered the snowflakes. Oh, owning the whoever's. That's not productive. It's not productive. I actually had one comment, commenter actually argued with me that the Dothraki were not a non-white race. It got that ridiculous. Like the, the, the Dothraki are basically the Hun. They are not, like they are not chevaliers. They are not mounted knights. They are much more of that sort of um, Eastern Europe bordering on Asia, you know, Russian, Chinese, Iran, border of that area, Afghanistan, all that stuff. They're brown people. They are. And just because you saw a few white faces on the show, that's not, that's not who they are. And I maintain that, and this is another issue I have with the historical accuracy angle with Game of Thrones. A lot of the times it's not actually historically accurate. A lot of the times it's drawing on the myths of history and that idea of the, the Hun as, um, you know, anybody with a curved blade being a savage was a dehumanization tactic to make people go out and be able to slaughter them without feeling like they were killing a person. They weren't as savage as they were made out to be. They were brutal. They were extremely tactical, but they weren't just driven by rage. That was a propaganda thing. Um, and I think with things like the, the Dothraki, George Martin wallowed in that historical myth. More same with some of the medieval Europe things. It's not as historically accurate or I'll say historically nuanced as the conceit around Game of Thrones would have you believe. Uh, and that... I think is a totally fair critique. But people get all freaked out because for some odd reason they have a real identity tied up in the show um, that I don't share. I was talking about Twitch, like how did Into the Badlands just m miss everyone's radar when people like obsessed with The Walking Dead and Game of Thrones? If you have not seen Into the Badlands, binge watch that shit, especially if you like um, wire foo combat. It's so great. Um, there are some some issues with pacing and plot holes and things like that, but it's it's there's much more space in the type of show it is for that, and you're okay with that than something like Game of Thrones or The Walking Dead because it's nowhere near as dark. It's actually just this explosion of color. So if you're looking for something to watch now that Game of Thrones is ending on Sunday, watch Into the Badlands. It's so good. It is the best East meets West fusion anything i have ever seen so that's my recommendation all wrapped there help support this channel become a monthly patron patreon.com slash liana k i don't have a question this week because this went wrong wrong long see you next week